Well, uh, we're going to continue to talk about fasting a little bit this week. Um, that may be um, something that you're quite familiar with. It, it may be um, something that's new to you. You learned last week from Tom's good message about some of the history, some of the wad of fasting, uh, where it comes from, and, and so forth. And um, it was, always, of course, a part of the Hebrew community. It was, for them, uh, always about food. Food was always what they fasted. And maybe you've given something up for Lent already um, in the past. Um, the two things that are most often given up, chocolate and coffee. Seems like we go to chocolate and coffee as our two um, identifiable addictions that we can give up for 40 days. And, and maybe when you did something like that, you know, you had a, a Lenten fast and it worked and, and you were done and you said, you know, I've grown in 40 days. I just feel better about my relationship with God and I, I know the power of the Lord. Maybe you got done and you just learned how much you really love chocolate, you know, because sometimes that happens when you stop something and then you go, wow, I can't wait for Easter. When I get to Easter, I'm going to eat so much chocolate, you know. We've got these Relent books, and wow, I'm really, uh, really uh, happy with the way these things came together. I wrote one of the lessons, and some other pastors wrote the other lessons. And in the beginning of it, if you haven't done this yet, in the beginning of it, the first four pages, uh, Griff wrote just a great introduction to, to fasting, and it really says more there than what I can uh, say today. But we want to focus today on the why on the motivations, uh, the purpose. And the fast that we have chosen has the purpose of lowering our resistance to God. Okay? The fast is not to lose weight. The fast is not just a sacrifice. But the fast is to lower our resistance to God. There may be, may be food, it may be an activity, it may be a practice. But I want us to to think of something, no matter what it is, that is directly connected to what our desire is for God, that the, what we want more of Him. And so, uh, you know, it may not just be just giving up chocolate does that for you. It, it really helps if you can connect it. Uh, we cease doing one thing so God can do something much better in our lives. And um, someplace where He wants to work. So, in the course of your fasting, you might um, become aware of how much time you take up in your lives with just filler, okay? That you just fill your life up with a bunch of junk. That's one of the things I'm working in. You might notice how much time that we spend thinking about food. In America, where we have plenty of food, it's strange that we spend so much time thinking about where am I going to eat? What am I going to get? Where do you want to go to dinner? Have you ever, it's kind of embarrassing, really, stop and think about it, on how much time we spend just thinking about food, and we have so much. You might notice the silence. Um, maybe the TV is off for a certain time. Uh, and so you might notice the silence that's, that's in life, or you might become aware of just the strong nature of the flesh, of how your desires really just kind of sometimes run rampant in us, and we just are pushed here to get this and that, and, and afterwards we look and we go, I, I feel so juvenile, I feel so weak when my desire pushes me. But more than that, if you're motivated for lowering your resistance to God, you'll notice that your faith is going to increase. You'll notice that you're going to believe better things about yourself, and you're going to believe better things about God. Now you will increase your resistance to temptation. And that's where I really want to go today. Uh, God leads us into discomfort. Discomfort is a condition to where the Spirit leads us to strengthen our hearts and increase our capacity for Him. And we, we naturally resist discomfort. Um, in America, the saying is, are they rich? No, they're comfortable. Right? And, and isn't that the American dream? is to get to the point where I don't have to worry about anything. I'm comfortable. Everything is taken care of. My life is just one of ease. That's, that's the picture of the early retirement in America, 
is that I can get to 45 or 50 and, and never worry about anything again. All my finances are taken care of and I have no concerns whatsoever. That not that the American dream? A lack of discomfort. You probably heard it said that God afflicts, that God comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. And that's my major point today, is that God is going to lead us into a season of discomfort. Jesus began his ministry. Remember, he presented himself down there to John the Baptist or John the Baptizer at the River Jordan. And John was baptizing for the remission of sins and for repentance. Jesus was baptized. And once that he was baptized, it said that the heaven opened. A dove descended and landed on him. And then this voice was heard by him that said, My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And you would think, well, that's a fantastic moment. Wow. You know, picture that. You think, well, now he'll, he'll start right into his preaching and his healing ministry. But instead, where he goes is he's led for 40 days into the wilderness. And that's our scripture. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Then the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness so that the devil might tempt him. After Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was starving. The tempter came to him and said, Since you are God's son, command these stones to become bread. Jesus replied, It is written, People won't live only by bread, but by every word spoken by God. After that, the devil brought him to the holy city and stood him at the highest point of the temple. He said to him, Since you are God's son... Throw yourself down, for it's written, I will command my angels concerning you, and they will take you up in their hands so that you won't hit your foot on a stone. Jesus replied, Again, it is written, Don't test the Lord your God. Then the devil brought him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said, I'll give you all these if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus responded, Go away, Satan. Because it's written, you will worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil left him and angels came and took care of him. Now we're going to look at all three of those temptations, each one in the, in the next three Sundays. Um, but today I want us to just think about temptation and the role of that in God's scheme of things in our lives. Notice that the Holy Spirit leads him into temptation, the testing. The wilderness, the number 40, reminds us, of course, of the 40 years of wandering that the people of Israel did when they left Egypt and were on their way to the promised land. And they were intended by God to go there directly, but they didn't have the faith. And as God tested them, they ended up staying in that wilderness for 40 years. So we remember that God led them into the wilderness the same way that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And God leads us into discomfort. And that's because we should expect some temptation. God does not tempt us. But the more that we seek him, the more we will be tempted. And I know that sounds weird and that sounds wrong, but it's true. Temptation is not sin. Failing at temptation will lead us into sin. As a strong follower of Christ, you are going to be tempted more than a weak follower of Christ. The temptation doesn't decrease as you grow in God. It increases you as you grow in God. And that's because when we are weak in God, we give in to temptations immediately. There's no reason for them to be a bunch of them because we just do whatever we want to do. Do whatever desire we have. But as you grow and become stronger, the temptations become more complicated, more deceitful, and they increase in number. Today, um, we are immersed in a culture where temptation is the primary means of advertising. Everywhere we look, there are temptations. Um, Sports Illustrated is coming out. I mean, this kind of soft porn for your living room is what it's going to be, right? Uh, most of the advertising that we have is temptation-driven, mainly by sex. How many of you like Hardee's? Right? All you got to do is look at one Hardy commercial and you see that they're not advertising the sandwich. What, what a, what a near-naked girl has to do with a sandwich, I don't know. But it's working, right? 
Temptations are just all around us. A 2011 study tracked the top temptations America faced. I think, of course, they ask people. They don't analyze their lives. They ask them, and we're liars by nature. So uh, some of these things I just don't buy. But here they are. Worrying or being anxious, 60%. Procrastinating, putting things off, 60%. Eating too much, 55% said that was often or sometimes. Spending too much time on media, 44% said they often or sometimes are tempted with that. Being lazy, 41%. Spending more money than they could afford, 35%. Gossiping about others, 26%. Being jealous or envious of others, 24%. Viewing pornography or sexually explicit material, 18%. Liars. (laughs) Abusing alcohol or drugs, 11%. Liars. If those two things were only that, the the multi-billion dollar industry of pornography in our nation and and alcohol sales would plummet. I mean, but anyway, that's what people answered. (laughs) When when asked if they tried to do anything specific to avoid giving in to temptation, 41% said yes and 59% said no. Almost 60% of us said no, I don't do anything to avoid the temptation. I just go with it. (laughs) Right? When people were asked why they give in to temptations, the top four reasons were, I'm not really sure, 50%, to escape or get away from real life, 20%, to feel less pain or loneliness, 8%, to satisfy other people's expectations of me, 7%. We should expect temptations if we're going to seek God. It's, it's going to come with it. The thing that to note, though, is that although God uh, sent Jesus into the wilderness, God did not tempt him. James 1, 12 through 15, that little video that we, we watched, used the 12th verse here, and that's where we start. It says, Those who stand firm during testing are blessed. They are tried and true. They will receive the life God has promised to those who love him as their reward. Verse 13, no one who is tested should say, God is tempting me. This is because God is not tempted by any form of evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Everyone is tempted by their own cravings. They are lured away and enticed by them. Once those cravings conceive, they give birth to sin, and when sin grows up, it gives birth to death. But God does not tempt. Rather, he gives us the power over temptation. But as we seek God, as we, as we seek to, to conform our lives to what his will is for us, uh, often we will enter into temptations in times of discomfort. Some of us are already probably in time of discomfort for Lent. I'm trying to break the habit of thinking that I must be entertained all the time. It's a very difficult addiction to break. I realize that I like to be entertained constantly unless I'm asleep. I'm just always looking for something to entertain me. And I'm at that point right now where I'm very uncomfortable. I don't know what to do with myself. Okay, I'm just kind of lost. Very uncomfortable. It'd be very easy just to go back to being entertained all the time. And so I'm at that point of discomfort. And Satan is tempting me. And he's saying, you can go down the basement and be entertained. Don, I won't know. Right? You can just open up your pad and be entertained right here. Nobody's going to know, right? But I'm not doing it for you, and I'm not doing it for Nina. I'm doing it for me. I'm trying to break my addiction to being entertained all the time. But Satan is tempting me, and God is going to prove his strength in me by giving me his power to overcome. And I know that by the end of 40 days that God will win. But right now, I'm very uncomfortable Now, most of our uh, failures, I think, concerning temptation are because we don't understand or we don't expect temptation to come to us. Remember, after Jesus had fasted 40 days and he was really hungry, he was starved, it was then that Satan came to him and said, Would you like some food? You can make your own. Just turn the stones into bread. Satan doesn't come to us when we are strong. He comes when we are weak. If your business is strong, you see, but your marriage is uh, not so strong right now, where's he going to attack? He's not going to attack you at work. He's going to attack you in your marriage. That's where he comes. 
The tempter will, will attack you at your weakness. If you're worried and not praying, well, he's going to give you some more things to worry about. He's going to go with it. If you're prone to pride, if that is your greatest weakness, then he's going to make you very successful so you can have more and more pride and eventually fail. If you're feeling inadequate, he might tempt you with uh, having a fantasy life where you're very successful. And he's going to give you all kinds of opportunities to build this other life and this other image of yourself in your mind so that uh, he might dominate you. He attacks the weakness. He knows the buttons to push. If you're short on time and you decide to give more time to God, what's going to happen? You're going to have less time immediately. You're going to be tempted with some kind of conflict on this time that you've given to God. And is going to try to take it away from you. You don't know how many people through the years have said, I want to do this. I'm going to sign up for this. And then immediately something comes into their life and they don't have the time. That's a temptation. See, they made a commitment to God and said, I want to do this. But then the time is taken away and they go, it must be God's way of telling me that I'm not supposed to do this right now. And I'm going, no, no, that's not God telling you that. Push through this, right? This is just a temptation. When we say we're going to give more to him, the temptation comes. When we're moving towards God, there's always going to be resistance. Resistance makes us stronger. If you're building muscles, what do you do? You put more resistance on the muscles, more weight, okay, more repetition. Uh, the little muscles tear a little bit and they rebuild, and that's what makes you stronger. Resistance to temptation is what helps us develop into Christ followers. Dallas Willard wrote the book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, and he said we should stop trying to be like Jesus. And that sounds wrong, too. He says, stop trying to be like Jesus. He said, Let's go deeper. He says, if you want to keep all of Jesus' commands, don't try to keep his commands. Become the kind of person who would easily and routinely keep his commands. Now, you might have gotten lost there, okay? He says, don't try to be like Jesus. Trained to be like Jesus. Start doing the kind of things that will turn you into the person who can keep his commands. There's a difference between training and trying. We try real hard. We think, well, that's my motivation. That's my intention. But does it translate into pushing through the temptations to actually doing it? Yesterday morning, I was coming in here about 830. And who did I see down here at the corner of Man of War and Richmond Road? But Jamie. Jamie's down there running. I think he's a long ways from home. What's, what's Jamie Johnson doing down here running? Well, I'm sure he didn't drive his car over here to be seen on Richmond Road running. He's a triathlete. He trains a lot, doesn't he? Constantly training. What if Jamie said, you know, I think I want to be a triathlete, so I'm going to get the movies, and I'm going to get the clothes, and I'm going to read the books, and I'm going to hang around with other triathletes, but I, there's no need to work out. I know all about it, right? That's the difference between trying and training. Train to be like Jesus. We don't just try to be like him. He was prayed up. He knew the Father's voice when he went into the wilderness. He didn't need to say, well, now, wait a minute. If I'm going to be tempted, I've got to go get things right in my heart, so I'm ready to be tempted. We should train to be like him. He followed into the wilderness so that he could conquer the temptations. He knew the word already. He didn't say, I've got to brush up on my Bible, so I'll have something to fight Satan back with. He knew what the word was. He had trained. He was in the Lord, so to speak. And that's our model as well. At every temptation, Jesus was ready. And he attacked back with the word of God. He said three times it is written. It is written. As the tempter had misquoted scripture to him, he in truth came back and said, No, it is written, thus saith the Lord, so to speak. Every temptation is a lie, both for him and for us. And the truth is what the only defense is. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will run away from you. Most translations say flee. I like this one. Run away from you. Submit to God, it says first. Runs away from us. <coughs> well, some of us are saying, well, uh, 
temptation thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail at that because I don't know the Word of God. You know, I, it's going to be terrible because if it's all about me knowing truth, I don't know that much Bible to fight back. And, and I'm easily duped and easily deceived. And so I want to encourage you on that just a little bit because, you know, you know enough. Every person knows enough right now. You will not be tempted beyond what you're able to endure. Uh, we, peop- we hear people say all the time, well, God, God will got, not give you more than what you can handle. That comes from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Paul said that first. He says, no temptation has seized you that isn't common for people, but God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with temptation, God will also supply a way out so that you will be able to endure it. God is not going to allow you to be tempted or tested beyond what you can handle. And that means he's going to give you his power to do that. So there, it's never, oh, I can't control myself. In his book, The Obedience Option, David Haig illustrates what he calls overwhelming faith. And he was talking to a young man, and the young man was being quite truthful with him and telling him that he was just subject and powerless over his promiscuity, that he slept with a variety of different women, and he just couldn't stop. And he was just powerless to do anything about it. So, the young man said he had figured out that God made him that way. And since God had made him that way, he was just going to go with it. Why fight it? This is just who he was. Boy, doesn't this fit our culture? God made me this way so I, you know, I can just do anything that I want to do. And so, um, David said, uh, he interrupted and he said, Well, suppose that I walked in, into your bedroom, just as you and this young lady are just getting ready to start. And as I walk into the bedroom, I pull out 10 $100 bills. And I say to you, would you rather have the money or her right now? What would you do? And David said, well, I'd take the money. He says, so it really isn't a desire that you cannot overcome. It's just, is it, that you do have some power over this. He says, what happened to the irresistible force of lust? And Haig concluded, we both realized a very simple truth, that one passion may seem irresistible until a greater passion comes along. If we take this principle and and take it into the area of living for Christ, it comes out like this. The only way to overcome this passion or to, be, to give into this temptation, this passion, this desire that we have, is with an overwhelming passion to live for Christ. That passion can be stronger, you see. And when we have that desire in us to live for God, to be a, what's called a righteous person, to fulfill our, our covenant relationship with God, then that passion can overcome anything. Here's a helpful definition that he gives for this overwhelming faith. He says, faith is a life-dominating conviction that all God has for me through obedience is better than anything Satan can offer me through selfishness and sin. Do we believe that? Do you know, I think this is crucial here. Do we believe that God just tests us to make us fail? Or do we believe that God really has something better for us? you see, than what this desire is. Quite honestly, I think a lot of us, not not just in this room, but a lot of us live thinking that God is trying to take something away from us. When really, what what He's trying to give us is a life that's much better, where we can resist those temptations, where His Spirit in us can be strong enough. You know, God wants to develop a passion in us, and we have to give Him a chance. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's pray for a minute.